17 through 31. But to begin with, I want us just to look at um, I want us just to look at one verse. That'll get us started. I want us to look at verse 28, Mark chapter 10 and verse 28. Notice carefully what Peter says here. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. That's a statement. It, it implies a question, but it's a statement. Peter's saying, we've left everything, Lord, to follow you. And you know what? They had. We. He and the other disciples, he and the other apostles, they had left everything. And they left everything to follow him. That's the statement. The implied question is, now what? Now that we've left everything to follow you, now what? I want to talk to you this morning on the subject that God is not a robber. You're not ever going to give up anything and God's going to leave you empty. Now, I didn't say you won't give up anything. You will. You're going to have losses in your life. Everybody does. But you're not going to end up on the short end. God is not a robber. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have this time together. Pray, Lord, that you'll bless and help us in these next few moments as we look into your word. Once again, Lord, forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your working your spirit speaking to us, and our hearing the message that you would have for us. And Lord, again, we pray if there's a soul listening who doesn't know you, may they come to trust you as their Savior now in this hour. And Lord, for those who do know you, may we evaluate our life through faith in you, trusting you each step and each day, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Contrary to what? Some people have taught in the last oh, couple of decades. You didn't really hear it much before that. The parlor of Jesus does not always have health, wealth, and prosperity. I've heard people say, well, if, you, if you're right with the Lord, if you're trusting Jesus, you, you should never be sick. Now, that's, that's absolutely absurd. You can be sick and still trust Jesus. Truth of the matter is, if that, if that were true, if, if you were right with God, if you were in right relationship with God and, and you'd never be sick, then you'd never die, would you? But you know, all the people who teach that, eventually they die. Everyone does. So again, that's, it's absurd. And then there are those who say, well, if you're right with God, you're going to have, you're a good relationship with him. You're going to have all the money you need and more, anything you want. I heard a whole sermon, guy preached a whole sermon one time, you want something? Call it and it'll be yours. He said, you got something you want to sell? Call it sold. It'll be sold. He said, you want a new Cadillac? Call it yours. And it'll be in your carport. Now, honestly, folks, if I could afford a new Cadillac, I wouldn't have a carport. I'd have a garage. But that, that's what he said. He said, it'd be in your carport. But the, the truth that I'm trying to get across to you is this. That's nonsense. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach us anything like that. Never. But what it does teach us is those things that we lose for Jesus are replaced with better things. Now, I know that from personal experience. Uh, sometimes it doesn't seem when you lose something like it's for any good at all. Sometimes it hurts and sometimes all you feel is the loss. And yet then the Lord has something better. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit and then we're gonna get into the text this morning. I want to talk to you about some people in the Bible that reinforce what I just told you. Think of Job. Job lost almost everything he valued. About the only thing he had left was his wife and his life. He had lost his children. He had lost his wealth. He had lost his health. Was Job human? Yes. Did he not feel all of this? Yes, he certainly did. Did he understand it all? No. He did not understand it all. He did not understand why all these things had happened to him and why it had such loss. But I want you to consider his response to all this. In Job 1, 20 to 22, it says, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. 
and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Job's wife is only mentioned briefly, and sometimes we get judgmental of her because of the harsh way that she spoke to Job, but we need to stop and understand she had lost her children too. And everything Job had lost, she had lost. And she didn't see things the same way Job did. She didn't say the Lord is given, the Lord is taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. She didn't say that. Here's what she said. And again, don't be too hard on her. This is a, a mother grieving for her children. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. What do you got left to live for? But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. What follows that is 35 chapters of conversation between Job and his friends. And his friends came originally, they said, to comfort him. But after 35 chapters of discussion, they come to the conclusion that everything that happened to him was his fault. Can I share something with you? There are going to be things that happen in our life, bad things that happen in our life, losses that occur in our life that are going to be our fault. They are. And they're definitely our fault. But not everything. There are things that happen over which you have no control whatsoever. Did Job have control over what happened to him? Not at all. What was happening to him was a satanic attack. Now, just like every problem you have, every loss you have, everything that goes wrong, don't take responsibility for all of it. If, if you have responsibility, if you are responsible, then take the responsibility. One time many years ago, many years ago, decades ago, we had, we had a little grass fire out here. And I came running in, and I told the fellow that was in here at the time, I said, call the fire department. We got a fire, grabbed a fire extinguisher, went back out. Fire department came, it's more to that story, but the fire department came and they, they got the fire out. Got the fire out, the leader of the fire truck, I say leader because I don't know what his rank was, but he said to me, he says, uh, who's responsible for this fire? I said, me. I didn't want to say that. I didn't want to say it was my fault, but it was. What am I going to do? I, said, oh, I don't know. I wasn't me. I just, I just, you know, can't say that. You know, I'll be honest with you. I hate it when something like that happens, and, and there, it isn't somebody else's fault. <laughs> you know, it's my fault. I have to take up with it. But not everything is. Some things happen that aren't your fault, and Job's problems were not his fault. And so you have to understand that. Sometimes it's your fault. Sometimes it isn't. Could it be a satanic attack? It can. Are there other possibilities? And the truth is there are other possibilities. Sometimes something bad happens to you or you suffer a loss because somebody else did something wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. Somebody else did. My daughter had graduated high school and she went out on a trip with the youth group here and they, they went on a camp trip and while she was gone I wanted to do something really really nice for her and I I searched ads and so forth and I drove my wife and I drove all the way up to Vero Beach and uh, I bought a 1979 Camaro Z28 and I brought it back and I had it sitting in the driveway when she got back from the trip big sign on the uh, windshield saying you know happy graduation something to that effect and she was so excited and that was wonderful and one night I was driving it and I'd been here at church working and I drove out the driveway here and I turned left and was going down Lake Ida Road and I'd stopped and a drunk driver fell asleep at the wheel and smashed in the rear end of it and that was the end of it now what did I do wrong in that case I didn't do anything wrong Somebody else did something wrong. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So sometimes those things happen to you also. It's not always your fault. Sometimes it is. It's not always Satan. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's neither. Sometimes you give up things as a matter of sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 to 12 tells us about Abraham who left everything to follow the Lord. 
It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. Didn't know where he was going. The Lord just said, go unto a land that I will show you. You know what the Lord was saying? Abraham, follow me. By faith, Hebrew says, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles at his tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him, with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Listen to what that says there. He was looking for the city that God built, a city not made with hands. Did Abram ever find that city on earth? He didn't. Well, I guess he looked in vain. No, he didn't do that either. He knew that God had something better for him. It goes on to say, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him, not Abram, the Lord, to be faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude and as the sand which is by the sea shore innumerable. Abram left everything. He left his home. He left his relatives. He left his job. He left everything just to follow the Lord. Didn't even know where he was going. He just trusted God. And God made of him a great nation. And through Abram, all the families of the earth were blessed and are blessed. Then we come to the New Testament. You look at the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians his letter to the church at Philippi, he described how he gave up everything to follow Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9, he said, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. He's about to tell us about himself. This was the man we know as Apostle Paul, but he was previously known as Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a young, up-and-coming man. He was educated. He had studied under some of the finest teachers. And in those days, the question was not, where did you go to school? Today, you might say, well, where did you get your degree from? What school did you get your degree from? That's not what they asked. They asked, who were your teachers? And he had studied under Gamaliel, one of the most respected teachers of that day and time. He had studied under other respected teachers, and he was considered extremely well-educated. And he was moving up in his circle of life. So he says, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherever he might trust in the flesh, I am more. He tells us some of it. He doesn't tell us all of it here. He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. What is he saying? A Hebrew of the Hebrews. You talk about a Jewish man, a Hebrew man, that was me. He says, I was touching the law, a Pharisee. The Pharisees, there were several different sects of Judaism in those days, and the Pharisees were the largest sect, and they were strict at keeping the law. He says, I was one of them. He said, concerning zeal, couldn't have been more zealous. Concerning the zeal, I, as a Jewish believer, uh, as a Jewish person, I meant to say, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. Nobody could come to him, he said, and accuse him of any violation of the law. Listen to what he says next. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Did you hear that? He says, I started to follow Jesus, and I lost everything I had gained, everything I had worked for all my life. Those things that were gained to me, I, those I counted lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Probably not how you would say it. That's how he said it. All those things I worked for, all the achievements I've had, all the titles I had, all the respect I had is like something you'd flush down the toilet. That's what he's saying. That I may win Christ. 
and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And that is the key to everything we're going to say this morning. Do you trust the Lord by faith? Do you trust him to save you? But not only do you trust him to save you, do you trust him to take care of you? Do you trust him to meet your needs? Well, you said earlier, the Bible doesn't guarantee you'll be rich. And that's true, and I'm not changing that. I'm not standing here telling you, if you'll follow Jesus, don't worry about it. You'll never have to worry about a penny the rest of your life. I'm not saying that. Why aren't you saying it? Because as we read the Bible, that's not what happened to people there. But what I am saying is this, God is not a robber. Now, first of all, who or what is a robber? Well, a robber is a person who robs. And you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, I already figured that part out. But what does it mean to rob? According to Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, to rob means, one, to take away, take something away by force, to steal from. To take, number two, personal property, by violence or threat. Then, to remove valuables without a right. Again, to take contents of a receptacle, of a container of some sort. Then to take away as loot, steal. That's a robber. Then it says to deprive of something due, expected, or desired to withhold unjustly or injuriously. That's what a robber is. God is not a robber. He does not take from us unjustly. He does not take from us without right. Now, I did not say that God will never take anything away from you. I said he does not take anything away from us without right. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 61 and verse 1, God says, I hate robbery. That's a direct quote. God said that. He said, I hate robbery. And then the word robbery does appear in Scripture in relation to Jesus. I read to you from Philippians 3 a moment ago. But the chapter before that, Philippians 2, Paul wrote this, Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he came in the form. And the word form there means in the appearance of God in the flesh, you saw him. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, and the word there is pogmos, which means to seize or take without right and by violence. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Do you understand what that's saying? God comes to earth and makes himself of no reputation. Now you think God could come to earth and... Say, here I am, fall down and worship me. And he could. But he came and made himself with no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because of all this, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above everything. Jesus himself said something about robbers. In John 10, verses 7 to 10, then said Jesus again unto them, said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What is he saying? He's saying the thief will come and take from you and destroy what you have and yes, possibly even kill you. I didn't come to take your life. I came to give you life. I didn't come to steal from you. I came to bless you. I came to give to you. In the 1800s, Francis Ridley Havergal wrote the words to many hymns. You can look up in our hymnal, other hymnals. One of them contains these words. 
I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom be and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Let's look at our text. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. Beginning at verse 17, we have a story. It's a true story. It's not a parable. It's a true story, actual event that happened. It's also recorded the same story in Matthew and Luke. But in Mark's version, Mark 10, 17 says, And when he, that's Jesus, was gone forth into the way, that means he's walking out in the road, there came one running. The fellow was anxious to see him. He came running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, that was a good question for the good master. He comes, this young man comes, and we're told in the other writers that he was a young man, came and he asked this question, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus first gave him the answer he expected. Look what he says. In verse 18, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now that, that is pretty much what he expected Jesus to say. Why do you call me good? No one's good but God. And that young man probably said, That's right, only God is good. And certainly you're not because only God is good. But the question requires more thought than that. Because Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Only one is good, and that's God. And if that's true, and it is, then either he's God, and he is good, or he's not good, and he's not God. So Jesus asked him that question to get him to think about it. Can I share something with you? In the Bible, God asks questions. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, God asks questions often. He asks people questions. He never, not one time, ever asked a question to find out the answer. Never did. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He already knows the answer. So if he already knows the answer, why does he ask the question? He asks the question so we'll think about the answer. He doesn't ask the question. Jesus doesn't say, why do you call me good? I'm not sure. Why would you think I was good? That's not what he's doing. He's saying, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Why does he say that? He wants this young man to think about that. Yeah, give that some thought. Think about what you're saying. But then he says something else the young man expected. In verse 19, he says, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. Most of the Ten Commandments. And I imagine, and I can only imagine, I wasn't there and it doesn't say this. I want to be clear about that, but I imagine that young man got a big smile on his face right then. And if he had lapels, I'm not sure if he did, but if he did, he probably put his thumbs in them, you know, on one of these. Big smile on his face. Because he says this, verse 20, he answered and said, I know, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. I've been doing those things all my life. And you know what? He probably had. He probably had. You think this fellow was that religious? Yeah, I think he was that religious. Do not commit adultery. He probably hadn't. Do not kill. He doubtless didn't kill. Do not steal. Probably never stole anything. Do not bear false witness. No, nope. defraud not. Don't cheat anybody. Honor thy father and thy mother. He'd probably done all that pretty good guy so the Lord's going to tell him he's missing one thing one thing verse 21 then Jesus beholding him loved him don't miss that Jesus loved this young man he's not playing with him he's not toying with him he's not trying to put anything over on him he's not trying to embarrass him or humiliate him He's trying to get him to come to a reasonable decision. 21 again, then Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. 
Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Notice what he said. I want you to go sell everything you have and give to the poor, but you'll have treasure in heaven. You know what he's saying? I, I'm, I'm not going to leave you empty. You're going to have treasure in heaven. And pay special attention to that. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven, but it's not finished. Let's start again, verse 21. Then said, then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Three things he asked him to do. One, come. Come to me. Throughout the Bible, you might want to do a word study on that sometime. How to do that. Get a good concordance and look up the word come in the Bible and just read it. It's, it'll be a fruitful study for you, I promise. Lord Jesus said, come. Second thing he said, take up your cross. Take up the cross. What does it mean to take up the cross? Oh, I know what that means, preacher. That means to bear my burdens. Let me tell you about my arthritis. and That's not what it means. It's what a lot of people think. By the way, you want to tell me about your arthritis, I'll tell you about mine. We'll have a long conversation, okay? <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to get across to you is this. It's not what he was saying. When he says take up the cross, what is the cross? It's an instrument of death. I always picture it this way. Jesus said, take up your cross. Okay, Lord, I got my cross. He says, now follow me. All right, where are we going? Going to that hill over there. What are we going to do when we get there? We're going to die. Oh, no, let me put this thing down. I don't want that. That's what he's asking. He's saying, not only sell everything give to the poor, give me your whole life. That's what he's asking. Follow me. Things were going good for this young man up to that point. But look at verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved. What made him sad? Come, take up your cross, follow me. That's what made him sad. And he walks away grieving. Why? For he had great possessions. Don't misunderstand what Jesus is about to say here. It's very important. It's easy to come to this conclusion. It's not the right one. If you've got money, you can't ever be right with God. And, and all people who have money are dirty crooks. And they, anybody's got money got it by being a crook. That's not what he's teaching here. It isn't. You read your Bible, you're going to find there are people in the Bible who had nothing who followed the Lord. You're also going to find that there are people who had a lot of money and they were rich and they also followed the Lord. You know why? Because God's primary interest, and I'm not going to tell you he doesn't care about your finances. He does. He cares about everything about you. But his primary interest isn't the size of your bank account. His primary interest is in your heart. So verse 23, And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that, have, that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? That is the key statement. It's not that you just have a lot. That doesn't keep you out of the kingdom of God. That what keeps you out is trusting in riches. Trusting in riches. I've met people, not many, but I've met a few people say, why should I thank God for anything? I've provided everything. I did this myself. I was sitting in someone's home one evening and we were having dinner and there were quite a few dinner guests, uh, not just one or two. And um, somebody at the table, I'm, I'm not sure who it was. I think, I think I know, but I don't want to say the wrong thing. Somebody at the table suggested that we Thank God for the food. And the lady house said that. Said, she said, why should I thank God for this food? I provided it. Now, had she paid for it? I'm sure she had. Maybe she went to the store and bought it. I don't know. 
Maybe she prepared it and cooked it, put it on the table. That's possible. I'm not, not, wouldn't argue any of that. But the fact that you're able to do all that is a gift from God. Let's look at verse 24 again. The disciples were astonished, astonished at his word, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust? And the word trust is so key here. As you trust your riches. It's not that you have money. That's, it's not sin to have money. It's not a sin to be poor either. But the truth of the matter is, it's not a sin to have money. And some people think that. I had a man tell me yesterday, he said, everybody who's rich in this country is a crook. Really? You know why you say that? Because you're not rich. <laughs> By the way, I'm not either in case you were wondering. But the key is not having money. The key is trusting, putting your trust in that. Which is basically, as we've already said, trusting yourself. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter in the kingdom of God? How hard is it? Verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, some Bible scholars are telling that Jesus didn't really mean the, the camel going through the eye of a sewing needle. That There was a, a passage nearby that was extremely narrow called the eye of the needle and that a camel had to get down on its knees and literally crawl on its knees to get through it. It was very difficult. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Either way. Either it's that or it's, it's going through a sewing needle. Either way, it's extremely hard, and that's what he's saying. Nearly impossible. How near to impossible? Well, look at verse 27, or 26. And they, the 12, were, dis, let's try it again. They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Excellent question. Who then can be saved? 27, And Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Go back, if you will, to verse 18. Jesus saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. The only one that can save us is God. I was standing on the sidewalk yesterday and a fellow was sitting at a table. We had a, a little conversation. It didn't last long. Uh, the reason it didn't last long is somebody else came up, started talking to the fellow, and he had business with him, so I, I went on my way. But he said to me, he says, uh, you're, you're a minister? I said, yes. He says, you're a pastor? I said, yes. He says, I grew up in a certain religion. And he says, I want to ask you something. He says, is it true? Do you, do you believe in divine absolution? I thought I knew what he meant by that, but to be honest with you, I wasn't sure. I said, well, define that. What do you mean? He says, do you believe that? God directly forgives sin? I said, absolutely, yes. I believe absolutely in divine absolution. Why do I believe that? Because only God can forgive sins. I said, Jesus said that. He said, only God forgives sins. He said, well, that's what I thought. That's what I wanted to know. I said, well, what do you do for forgiveness? He said, oh, I've, I've trusted Jesus, but I wanted to be sure because that's not how I was brought up. It's not what I was taught growing up. He says, I was taught that People had to forgive me, and, and I want to know that God can forgive me. I said, well, he sure can. So that's what Jesus is saying in verse 27. Jesus looking upon them saith, with men it is, it is impossible, but not with God. With God all things are possible. Now that brings us back to where we started, verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. Now, keep it in context. He asked this rich young man, said, won't you give up everything and follow me? And what did he do? He went away sorrowing. But you know what's Peter saying? Well, we did. We left everything and followed you. He didn't, but we did. And again, they had. They had left everything. They would given it up. Peter and James and John were in business with, with James and John's father. They were in the fishing business. And apparently they were doing pretty well at it. Now, I don't think they were wealthy men. doesn't indicate that. But apparently they were doing okay. 
I've told you this before, but you go to Capernaum there, that's where they lived. They were from Bethsaida, a village nearby, but their business was in Capernaum. And if you go to Capernaum, they show you a house there, ruins of a house, and they'll tell you that's Peter's house. Now, it could be. Peter definitely lived somewhere in that area. But I looked at that house, and they said, that's Peter's house. I said, how do you know? They said, what do you mean? I said, well, how do you know that's Peter's house? How do you know it's not somebody else's house? Well, it's Peter's house. I said, did you find his mailbox? How do you know that that's his house? <laughs> how in the world would you know after 2,000 years that that's the house Peter lived in? I don't know how you would know that. But he lived somewhere in that area, and so did James and John. They had their business. Matthew, fellow who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he worked for the Roman government as a tax collector, and he, he was a rich man. We can go on and on with the, the different apostles and what they did, but the point is they had given up everything. Jesus came to Matthew when he was sitting there collecting taxes for the Romans. He said, come follow me. And Matthew got up right then, left everything, followed him. He goes to Peter in the fishing boat, says, follow me. Peter left his boat, followed him. So when Peter says, we've, we've, we did, we did what you asked that young man to do. We've left all and have followed thee. Verse 29, and Jesus answered and said, remember what he said back in verse 21 to the young man? said he loved him. He said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And if there was a period there, then that would have left the fellow with nothing, I suppose. But there's no period there. It says, And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Look now at verse 29. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake in the gospel. Now, have people left those things? Have people lost those things following the Lord? Yes. I was listening last night to a man tell the story of Adoniram Judson. Maybe you say, well, who was that? He was the first American missionary ever sent out. He went to Burma with the gospel. Uh, obviously, there had been British missionaries and Scottish missionaries and others before that. But he was the first American missionary to be sent out. As you can imagine, that was a long time ago. And he was brought up in a Christian home, but he had gotten away from God. And then he went through a very traumatic experience, and he came back. The Lord gave his heart to the Lord. He left out as a missionary. He took his family with him. And out on the mission field... His wife got sick and passed away. And his children got sick and passed away. And he worked seven years in Burma. Now they call it Myanmar. But he worked seven years in Burma before one person ever trusted Jesus as their Savior. Seven years. And then he worked longer. And he translated the Bible into the local language so they could understand it. And that's the translation still used in that country to this day. Then he felt that he needed to go back to the U.S. for a while. And on the ship, on the way back, he got sick too and he died. Now here's a man who gave everything. I mean, gave it all. And so when Jesus says, there's no man that has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake in the Gospels. Have people done that? They have. And you might think, that's terrible. Look at all they gave up. Look at all they lost. I don't want to do that. That's like that taking up the cross stuff. I don't want to do that. The story doesn't end there. No period at the end of verse 29. Verse 30 continues the thought. No man has left these things, but he shall receive an hundredfold. Now stop right there. You know what the Lord's saying? 
Anybody who gives up any of this for me, I'm going to pay him back a hundred times over. A hundred times over. You can't get that kind of interest in any investment, but you can here. I'm going to pay you back a hundred times over. Now put it in, in modern American terms, you give up a dollar for me, I'll give you a hundred dollars. Oh boy, let me get that back here, the offering plate. That's, don't, don't, don't go too fast, folks. But I want to show you what he's saying here. But he shall receive an hundredfold. Look at the next phrase. Now, in this time. You know what God's saying? You know what Lord Jesus is saying? He's saying, you give up something for me, I'm going to pay you back a hundred times over not in heaven, but now in this life. I'm going to take care of you. Now again, that doesn't mean if you put a dollar in the offering plate, you're going to get a hundred. What it means is God's going to bless you and take care of your needs. He's going to give you what you need. He is. He shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. What's he going to receive? Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers, and children, and lands. And by the way, where he says lands, think home. Now that sounds better, doesn't it? I'm going to pay you back 100 times over. Next two words we don't like so much. He says, with persecutions. You follow the Lord, you're going to receive persecutions. We talked about that a Sunday or two ago. You follow the Lord, you're going to receive persecutions. Paul wrote, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It happens. And it's on the rise, folks. We, I, I, I say this in one way or another just about every week, but I want you to know it's on the rise, the persecution of Christians. So you, have you heard that there's a, a, a resurgence of anti-Semitism? And you could stop and think, well, what does that have to do with me? I'm not Jewish. What do I care? I'll tell you, it has a lot to do with you. It has a lot to do with you. There is a close, very close relationship between anti-Semitism and persecution of Christians. It's very closely related. Don't you dare think it has nothing to do with you. But again, verse 30, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and on top of all that in the world to come eternal life. Get all that and eternal life. God's going to take care of you in this life and then he's going to give you eternal life. You see what I'm saying? God is not a robber. He's not going to take things from you and leave you with nothing. So maybe you're like Peter. Maybe you say, well, I, I've left all and followed you. The Lord says he's going to pay you back. Now look at verse 31. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. What does that mean? Well, it's a simple statement. Jesus says it more than once. But what he's saying here is this. Many people who are first shall be last. What he's saying is people who are very important in this life may not be in eternity. And many people who seem obscure and in insignificant in this life may be very prominent in eternity. Why is that? Because again, God's not looking at what you have materially. He's not looking at what you have achieved in society or in business or in other fields. What he's looking for is what's going on in your heart and are you serving him and what have you accomplished for him? That's what he's looking for. Don't misunderstand the message this morning. Don't misunderstand what I've said. Don't misunderstand what the Lord said. If you've worked hard and done well, that is not a bad thing. Be thankful for what you have. And I'm not telling you don't work hard and try to do well. It would be silly to tell you that. 
you know, you read the rest of your Bible, you're going to find out God does not expect you to sit around and do nothing. He really doesn't. It's quite clear in Scripture. But what we're trying to help you to understand is everything in this life is temporary and everything in this life is going to pass away. Build into your life those things that are going to last forever. When I was a teenager and a young Christian, we sang a lot of songs that, that were not in the hymnal. They're not bad songs or they just weren't in our hymnal. They're Christian songs. I came across the name of one lady who wrote a lot of poems and a lot of her poems were set to music and we sang some of them. That's true, there's several people out there. Can I interject something right here? I'm not saying men haven't done any because they certainly have, but I'm gonna tell you some of the best loved hymns ever written been written by women. And uh, you, you, you ought to notice that. To Martha Schnell, Martha Schnell Nicholson lived with four incurable diseases all at the same time. And yet, like many others, she didn't have what most people treasure. She did treasure being a child of God. And she didn't let her diseases discourage her from loving the Lord or serving the Lord. So she wrote poetry. One of her poems tells us that God is not a robber. Here's what it says. One by one, he took them from me, all the things I valued most. Until I was empty handed, every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highway grieving in my rags and poverty. Till I heard his voice inviting, lift your empty hands to me. So I held my hands toward heaven, and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God could not pour his riches into hands already full. A year before I was born, Ira Stanfield copyrighted a song with, with these words said, I traveled down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowed me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folks were treating me and then I heard him saying tenderly, my feet were all so weary upon the Calvary road. The cross became so heavy I fell beneath the load. Be faithful, weary pilgrim, the morning I can see. Just lift your cross and follow close to me. I worked so hard for Jesus, I often boast and say, I've sacrificed a lot of things to walk the narrow way. I gave up fame and fortune. I'm worth a lot to thee. And then I heard him gently say to me, I left the throne of glory and counted it but loss. My hands were nailed in anger upon the cruel cross. But now we'll make the journey with your hands saved in mine. So lift your cross and follow close to me. Oh Jesus, if I die upon a foreign field someday, t'would be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. If just a cup of water I place into your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if by death the living they can thy glory see, I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. Now maybe you're wondering, well, that all sounds good, fine, maybe you believe that. But have you ever actually seen God give back to someone more than they gave to him? Many times. Many times. I could tell you story after story of people I've known personally. Let me, let, let me share just a couple with you. I met a man years ago, he's with the Lord now, but he left everything to take his family 
down to a place in South America that I'd never even heard of, to tell you the honest truth. And when I first heard of it, I thought, where is that? And they lived in a rough conditions. But they had a wonderful ministry among the people in that area, uh, people who had not been reached with the gospel. Back here in the States, they were Americans back here in the States. They didn't own a house. They didn't own a car. But you know what he told me? He said, when I come home, when my wife and I come home and, and we're back on furlough, there are people who say to me all over this country, my house is your house. You need to stay here. I talked to him one day. He was driving a beautiful, brand new Chevy Monte Carlo, which in its day was a, a very nice automobile. And I said, boy, is that yours? He said, no, but I get to drive it. He said, all I want to. I'll ask you something. Did he get the short end of the stick? I don't think so. I don't think so. I can tell you about a lady who left to go to another land. And she spent her life there. And she's with the Lord now, too. She left family and friends and everything to go to a place that she'd never been before. Spent her life there. And God gave her so much. Yes, I've seen it. I've seen it time and time again. So the question is not, have you ever seen God give back more than they've given him? The question is, what would you give to follow him? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we trust you. It's all about trust. We trust you to save us, to forgive our sins, to save our souls. And then we trust you to take care of us as we follow you. And Lord, we need your care. But we need to trust you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let me ask you a couple of simple questions. Number one, do you trust the Lord Jesus? Do you trust him? And here's what I mean by that. Number one, have you trusted him to forgive your sins? Like the man I talked to at the table the, yesterday. He needed to trust Jesus. He said he understood. He needed to trust Jesus and be saved. Have his sins forgiven. We all need that. All of us. Not one of us can say that we've not sinned. So all of us need to be forgiven. Have you trusted Jesus to forgive you? He paid for your sins at the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And he says, he that believes on me has everlasting life. Put your faith and trust in him. Ask him to forgive you. If you don't understand all of it, that's, that's okay. You just trust him. You'll learn more and more as you grow. Secondly, do you trust him with your everyday life? Yes, you trust him to take you to heaven, but what about trusting him to get you through this life? Say, well, what does the Lord require of me? Well, read your Bible, you'll know. Ask him, pray. Surrender your heart to him. Step by step, day by day, he'll show you what you need to know. When Saul of Tarsus got saved, he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said, go into the town. It'll be told you what to do next. He'll do you the same way. But it begins with that idea, that concept of trust. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your life right now. Let him speak to your heart. Say to him, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then be ready to do it. If God's spoken to your heart. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. There's a decision you need to make. You need to do business with God and want you to come. If you need somebody to pray with you, you come. If you need to talk to somebody, we'll be here for a little bit after the service. Be glad to talk to you. You let the Lord have his will and his way in your life. Father, bless and move this invitation time we pray in Jesus' name. If God's speaking to you, you need.